Hi, my name is Matthew Remsky. On April 1st to 3rd, I'll be in Calgary at the Yoga and Meditation Center of Calgary. And then on April 15th through 17th, I'll be in Ottawa at the Ottawa Embodied School of Yoga Therapy. And in both locations, uh, over two days each, I'll be presenting material from the What Are We Actually Doing in Asana Project. So I thought I'd put together a little bit of a uh, promo to let participants know what they can expect because this is not your typical um, yoga intensive weekend so I just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, the format for both of these events is going to include a fair amount of presentation but in a dialogical format so encouraging a lot of discussion. Um, a lot of journaling as well and uh, to break up all of the heavy brain work uh, we're going to be uh, taking advantage of some self-guided movement at periodic breaks in both locations. Um, because the, the focus of my research over the last two years has really been on the sort of ground zero of bodily experience in postural yoga, uh, I'll be starting each session with a number of questions for consideration. Questions like, uh, what sensations do you value most in asana? Uh, questions like, what sensations do you associate with ideas like freedom or liberation or grounding? Uh, and I find that once we really give, uh, you know, descriptions to the sensations that we crave, we have um, a little bit of a strategy for figuring out what we actually want when we step onto the mat and how that changes. Um, questions like, has asana practice ever been painful for you? And the corollary to that is, what meanings have you given or do you give to pain? What kind of story does pain tell, uh, if it tells one at all? Um, there are some theorists who remark that pain actually removes all stories, and we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that as well. And then finally, um, a very tricky question. Uh, what's the difference between discomfort, pain, and injury? This is something that people who spend their entire lives researching pain are uh, struggling to, you know, you know, grasp a, a, even a beginning understanding of. Uh, but it's something that I think asana practitioners are uh, wondering about, uh, exploring in their bodies every day. Um, the themes for exploration in both events uh, are going to be broad ranging. Um, I'll try to sort of steer this little uh, promotion through um, uh, the order of business. You know, primarily, uh, we have to start, if we want a kind of natural history of sensation in postural yoga, we have to start with visions of the body throughout the history of Indian wisdom culture. Uh, so we'll spend some time on that, uh, looking at things like the cosmic body, the body of sacrifice, uh, and also the later uh, tantric and medieval hatha yoga bodies of internal exploration. Then, of course, um, we have to look at terms and ideals like tapas and moksha to try to understand how they've been somatized throughout history, but then also uh, today on the mat. And to help with that, I'll be quoting from some of the 200 or so interviews that I've done with uh, asana practitioners over the last two and a half years. Um, uh, most of them have told me stories of discomfort, pain, injury, and healing. Uh, there's a number of those interview subjects who are also, you know, experts in pain neurology, you know, Sanskrit scholars, um, uh, historians of, of yoga and historians of fitness culture, um, a lot of feminist scholars I'm talking to as well uh, to look at the gender dynamic of uh, the somatics of of uh, modern yoga. And uh, yeah, then there's this issue of demonstration and performance, um, which actually is at the root of what Mark Singleton and his supervisor, Elizabeth DeMichaelis, 
uh, speak of as the Mysore Asana revival. Uh, so how has demonstration performance and visual media both transformed and continued the bodily concerns and anxieties of yoga history? It will be uh, a very juicy question that we'll chew on. Um, yeah, uh, visual media, uh, performance, demonstration, uh, moksha, tapas, when we encounter incredible um, uh, exuberant, ecstatic images like this, what are we being told about the body? Um, what are we being told about our bodies? Uh, what are we being told to consider about the internal state of the pictorial subject? Um, how do the themes of sacrifice, creation, and demonstration meld together? And what might the long-term impacts be uh, with regard to um, uh, such levels of performance as we are shown all the time through the predominantly visual communication of modern yoga? Um, yeah, demonstration goes way back. Uh, it's right at the root. Uh, demonstration, physical mastery, um, uh, a kind of uh, dignity gained and moral bearing gained through physical effort and exertion and the willingness to sacrifice and to bear pain. Uh, these virtues, these qualities uh, have cast, have deep roots within the modern yoga system and they cast very, very long shadows. Uh, this picture, of course, from the uh, courtyard of the Mysore Palace, 1938, uh, with Keshava Murti, uh, the orphan who ran away just weeks before he was to perform uh, in a grand exhibition under the tutelage of his guru, Sri Krishnamacharya, and that's what gave uh, BKS Iyengar his start. Um, that's Keshava Murti on the, on the ground right in front, uh, doing that incredible Hasta Pangushtasana um, posture. Uh, Patabi Joyce is in uh, Pincha Mayurasana, her forearm stand heading towards Pincha uh, on the left hand side, and then of course, uh, Mr. Krishnamacharya himself uh, uh, showing the uh, incredible bravery and perhaps forbearance of what looks to be a 12-year-old boy uh, as he stands on him in Raja Kapatasana. Um, there are attitudes uh, to be explored in uh, photographs like this, resonances to be explored that I think have great impact uh, and and uh, meaning to us today, and we'll be taking a long, uh, quiet, thoughtful, respectful look at all of those things. Um, a key theme that will overarch the entire weekend in both cases, both in, Chicago, in uh, Calgary and in Ottawa, is what I have started to describe in my writing and my research and started to try to research more as the, uh, the uneasy relationship between ideals of therapy and ideals of transcendence. Um, uh, the notion that yoga could be a therapeutic pursuit is quite a modern idea, and yet it has totally overtaken the popular discourse. Uh, we imply that yoga is meant for healing, that yoga is meant to be individually applied to uh, the practitioner's circumstances. We uh, use yoga as a way of adapting to the stresses of life, and all of these aspirations are at odds with, if not directly contradictory, to the pre-modern uh, and predominant aspiration towards transcendence or self-deconstruction. Now, um, there are ways in which these two aspirations flow together, but also ways in which, especially if they are unconsciously mingled, uh, they can begin to confound each other. So uh, we'll be talking about that quite a bit. Um, and, oh yeah, you can you can pause the video here if you want to read through some of the some of the notes that I have. But I'll just bolt on. Uh, the other dichotomy that I'll be exploring over these weekends is the uh, somatic meanings and aspirations uh, of the compression to extension scale. So when you're on the mat, uh, the the we can group sensations 
as um, uh, roughly as twofold. Now, they're also interdependent, and and there's a there's kind of like a uh, an ongoing dialogue between them. But uh, the the compressive sends uh, certain singles signals, and the extensive sends certain other signals. And we'll take a good long look at again where those two uh, impetuses work together and where they might be at odds with each other. I'm going to make the argument that uh, the vast majority of yoga discourse and yoga, yoga marketing and the visual aesthetics of yoga move towards the extension, the right side of uh, this scale. And um, that has some, some, that can have some pretty serious physical consequences. Um, you know, as I like to say, uh, you know, there, there is no, there is no compression oriented Instagram yogi feed. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there's somebody who's doing restorative yoga postures on Instagram, but, uh, they're not getting hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, so I would then go on to say that the compressive is probably more integrated with the somatics of therapy, whereas the extensive uh, is more related to the aesthetics of performance demonstration, but also the metaphysics of moksha. So obviously there's a lot to unpack there. Um, now, uh, the last thing that I'll, I'll just preview here uh, for a moment is um, an issue that is very close to my heart. Um, it's uh, the exploration of the difference between discipline and spontaneity in asana. Overwhelmingly, uh, modern postural yoga has oriented itself towards discipline. And uh, there's an untold story, however, and I think we can find it uh, by beginning to look at uh, not only old texts, but also at uh, some of uh, our early modern forebears. So I'll start with a couple of quotes uh, for, this, for this little piece. The first one is from the Ganeshwar Gita, uh, where it says, this is a commentary, a, a 14th century commentary, I believe 14th century on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, which at one point says, that is called yogic action of the body, in which reason takes no part, and which does not originate as an idea springing in the mind. To speak simply, yogis perform actions called asanas, kriyas, bandhas, and mudras with their bodies like the innocent, natural, sahaja movements of children. Um, and as the father of a three-and-a-half-year-old boy and uh, a baby who is going to be arriving uh, we think at the end of May, uh, this is very precious to me because I often wonder, looking back at my own 15 years of asana practice, um, what did learning asana have to do with the way in which I originally learned to move as a human being? Um, how did asana, um, uh, how was it similar to and different from the ways in which I came to know my body? Uh, from the womb. Um, there are some similarities, but there are many differences. Uh, and the differences can be pretty much encapsulated by the approach to asana that uh, Peter Blackaby, the osteopath and uh, yoga master instructor in England, uh, calls the computational mode of instruction, in which the body is told to do specific things in a specific order. Uh, and when you realize that uh, nobody actually moves, learns how to move that way, nobody learns how to do anything that way, then we can start asking some questions about, um, well, what are we actually doing in asana? The second quote, uh, one should know that as, sorry, one should know that as real posture in which the meditation on Brahman flows spontaneously and unceasingly and not any other that destroys one's happiness. Uh, and that's from the Aparokshana Bhuti uh, text, um, verse 112. And I think that uh, what I'm getting at here can be really succinctly summed up uh, in this image, where on one side we have the uh, very elegant, but also um, uh, somewhat uh, adroit 
and very disciplined and perhaps even militarized Tadasana of Mr. Iyengar from Light on Yoga, uh, the best-selling yoga instructional manual in the history of humanity. Uh, over three million copies sold. And then on the other side, we have um, caught in a rare moment because this is not somebody who demonstrated. Mr. Iyengar claims to have given uh, 15,000 demonstrations in his life, whereas Swami Kripalvananda, uh, who is the other figure on the right side, uh, has uh, um, uh, went into his ecstasy of mudra and asana mainly when nobody was looking. You know that old adage around dancing uh, as if nobody's watching. Well, uh, that was his style, and there's only several dozen photographs of him in spontaneous movement. Now, uh, one thing that I'll say about the interviews that I've done so far is that um, uh, in, in, as I've said, 200 interviews, not a single person has described being injured through spontaneous movement. Um, the, in general, uh, we are injured because uh, we follow the instructions of other people. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, there, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room there, and there are some caveats, but that's the basic uh, takeaway. Uh, and so the other thing that I'll say about this comparison, and, and we'll spend a lot of time on this on these on these two weekends, is that. Um, is that uh, um, in one, in the light on yoga image, we're being presented with asana as a cause of something, as a uh, uh, as an intentional gestural movement uh, that is meant to cause a particular effect. And then on the other side, Swami Kripalvananda, who is Mr. Iyengar's uh, uh, contemporary, but senior by five years. He's born in 1913, whereas Mr. Iyengar is born in 1918. Uh, but Swami Kripalvananda viewed asana as being the direct result of an internal awakened state. So, yeah, uh, lots to talk about, um, lots to reflect upon, lots to journal about, and lots to explore in little tasty movement breaks uh, throughout these two weekends. Um, I really look forward to it. I hope uh, to meet as many of you as I can and to also hear your stories. This is the other thing that happens in these weekends is that uh, um, uh, going over this material really frees people up to speak transparently about their own experiences in asana. And generally those stories do not follow the conventional, you know, marketing narratives of love and light and rainbows and unicorns. It's, uh, you know, this, this is an art form that's a lot more uh, shadowy than that. Uh, that's what makes it so rich. That's what makes it so attractive. Uh, that's why we love it. Uh, and I hope to celebrate it with you. All right. See you soon.